another multicultural story time. So as you guys know, last time we spoke, I said that it was going to be in person, but because of COVID, we are still lucky enough to have our friends Aruj come in here and do a live virtual story time about her culture of Pakistan. So I'll let her take this one. Yeah, thank you so much, Anita, for having me. It's so nice to be back in the Lawrence Public Library. Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't all be together today, but it's important to keep everyone healthy and safe. So um, if we take these precautions now, maybe we can be together soon. Like the Rouge would know, she's studying to become a doctor. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, please wash your hands, wear a mask, get vaccinated if you can. Um, and then there will be in-person multicultural story times in our future. So today we're going to be reading two books that talk about a culture and a religion that you might not be familiar with. And I wanted to give a little bit of an explanation about culture and religion, especially since for me, those two things are connected and they're not, they're not always for everybody. Um, and so culture is a word that we use to describe traditions that come from certain places. And this could be holidays or food or music, um, even specific musical instruments. And so while we're reading today, I really want you to think about things that remind you of your specific culture. Um, and that can even be on a small level. So when I think of Lawrence, a big thing about Lawrence culture is KU and Jayhawks and, you know, uh, Mass Street and the lights on Mass Street and the holiday times. So keep some of those things in your mind. And the other thing I want you to think about is religion and the way that that sometimes overlaps. So um, holidays especially are one place where religion and culture can overlap. And one example is Christmas was a few weeks ago. Um, and people celebrate Christmas all over the world, but that does look different um, in some places. So in the Midwest, you might end up putting little gifts inside of your stockings, and you might put those stockings by your fireplace. But in places like Europe, sometimes those end up being uh, little gifts that you put into little kids' shoes. Um, and that's a small detail, small difference, but it's just a cultural thing. Um, and that's an example of like a connection of those two things. So overall, I want you to think about symbols, and so stockings are a symbol, the lights on Mass Street are a symbol, um, if you think about symbols of America, those could be things like a bald eagle or fireworks or um, the stars and stripes on the flag. And to talk about Pakistan, I'll share with you guys some of the symbols that I think about. So I was born in Pakistan, but I came here when I was pretty young, so I don't have a ton of memories about it. Um, and the first book that we're reading today is going to be set there. And so when I think of Pakistan, I think of the color green and the crescent moon on the Pakistani flag, which I'll show you guys right here. So there's a crescent moon and a star, and um, the Pakistani language, um, the main language there, is called Urdu. And so I wanted to show you guys a little bit about what Urdu looks like. So in English, we write and we read from left to right. right? Attention library patrons, this is a gentle reminder to <laughs> well, keep a mask over your nose and mouth and stay at least six feet away from mask. others. <laughs> You Thank you for helping us keep time. each other slip to make and sure our that community you guys can see safe. properly. Because we're not entirely sure. We can't see ourselves. So yes, we'll double check right now. Oh yeah, perfect. All right, we're good. All right. And so, yeah, that announcement was important. Um, so left to right in English. So that's Pakistan down there written out. And then in Urdu, you read from right to left. So this is Pakistan going this way. Um, and another example, uh, my name is Aruj. I spell that A-R-O-O-G. And when you see my name written in Urdu, it's spelled this way. So Arduj like that. I also wear it on my necklace. Um, just something to keep me close to my culture and remind me of the language and stuff. So a big thing about Pakistani culture is like really bright colors. So you get to see that a lot on um, wedding days and you know just walking down the streets um, and going shopping for clothes. Like right now I'm wearing a kameez. Um, it's super fancy, has some embroidery on there. Um, and this is gray, uh, it's silvery gray, but uh, lots and lots of bright color options too, which you can see when I show you guys um, these scarves in a little bit. Um, that bright blue over there. And there were other options that I could have brought, but I stuck with one for now. Um, and another place that you see a lot of colors, which um, Miss Anita is going to post about later, are on these really fancy decorated trucks in Pakistan. So we see trucks all the time on the highways in the U.S. too, but in Pakistan, those same trucks are decorated super, super fancy with bright colors and lots of symbols. Um, and Pakistan was a British colony until 1947. So if you're interested in this, you want to look it up. You're going to use the British word for truck, which is lorry. It's spelled L-O-R-R-Y. Um, and 
the colors on that truck, the colors on these scarves, all of these colors together are going to get represented in this book about basant. So let's say that word together, basant, it's spelled like this, and it's also written out in Urdu like this, basant. And this is a festival that happens in the spring in Pakistan, usually at the end of February or the beginning of March, and it's all about making and flying your own kites. Um, they fill the sky and people fly them from the rooftop, which sounds silly to us because our roofs look like this, but the roofs in Pakistan are nice and flat. They're a lot like a patio, um, and especially in the summertime when I go and visit, I like to sleep up there at night because it's nice and cool, nice and relaxing. Um, and so we'll see our main character flying his kite from the roof. And we're going to go ahead and get started and read about the sun. This is our book. It's called King for a Day by Roxana Khan, and it's illustrated by Christine Cromer. And I want to show you guys that beautiful cover. Um, our craft today is also related to this, so you'll get to see a page inside of your craft kit uh, from here with all these like bright, beautiful colors and illustrations. So let's get started. Basant is the most exciting day of the year. With feasts and music and parties, people celebrate the arrival of spring, and many will make their way to the rooftops of Lahore to test their skills in kite flying battles. My brother and sister arrive, still rubbing sleep from their eyes. My brother asks, Malik, is that all you made? My sister says, how can you be king of Basant with only one kite? It's called Falcon. Inshallah, it will be fast enough. I send my brother many blocks downwind to catch the kites that I will set free. Let's see his family right here. There is the bully next door. It's time to make him pay for hitting me and throwing stones at my sister. I'll get back at him with Falcon. The bully shouts at us, calling my sister a bad name. My sister yells right back, but when she turns around, I can see she's hurt inside. The breeze lifts the bully's huge kite. His kite is so big, I nickname it Goliath. It must have cost a fortune. But Falcon is small and built for speed. I let out enough of my special string for my sister to carry Falcon to the edge of the roof. Don't step on the tails, I cry. Don't rip them. Let me see the difference in the kites over here. On the count of three, my sister jumps. I tug on the string and Falcon leaps into the sky. I'm ready to attack. I work my string, dipping Falcon so it circles Goliath. Because it is so big, Goliath is slow. My kite string rubs the bully's kite string. Snip! I've sliced it. Goliath flies free, and the bully's string drops from the sky. Like a fishing line, it's nothing on the hook. The bully picks up his other kite, a smaller, faster one. He gets it climbing on the rising currents of air until it's almost as high as Falcon. I take a deep breath, bracing myself. The bully's kite circles, trying to trap Falcon. I move away, watching closely for the next attack. The bully pulls his kite left. Quickly, I pull down as hard as I can, sending Falcon into a steep dive. Let up, Malik, my sister yells. You're going to crash. Just before Falcon hits the rooftop, I pull it up and around several times, snagging the bully's string so he cannot get it free. I reel in the bully's kite so my sister can grab it. The bully's done. He has no more kites. He storms downstairs. I move on to the other kites. It's easy for Falcon to pluck them from the sky as if it really is a bird of prey. Big kites, little kites, fancy and plain. Even kites made of old newspapers. Sometimes I catch them in groups, making wide circles around clusters of kites. Falcon slashes through their strings. For a while, the kites fly where the wind carries them. When they land, they'll belong to whoever finds them, but at least they will have tasted freedom. Inshallah, I really am the king of Basant today. Throughout the day, my brother brings some of the kites I have freed up to the roof. Among them is Goliath. My sister stacks them in a pile. 
Sometimes loose kites float close enough for me to catch. Falk entangles their strings and I draw them in. My sister catches some too. She uses a long bamboo pole topped with thorns. If I am king, she is queen of the sun. At the end of the day, we have a big pile of kites. I choose the two I want, then my brother and sister get their picks. After they're chosen, they start back downstairs. My sister says, Malik, you coming? Not yet. The sun is setting on a magnificent day. I want to stay up here to watch, to feel the cool breeze. I want to make my day last a little bit longer. Suddenly, I hear yelling from below. The bully pushes a young girl to the ground. Then he grabs her kite and runs into his house. The girl gets to her feet, sobbing. She heads down the alley, trailing the kite string behind her. Something makes me pick up Goliath and drop it over the side of the roof. It floats, slicing the air side to side and lands close beside her. The crying stops. The girl picks up Goliath. I duck just as she looks up to see where it came from. When I look again, she's dancing along. Then she rounds the corner. She's gone. One by one, the stars come out till they shine down like a million jeweled kites. My day is done. I'm no longer king of the sun. It's time to go downstairs and join my brother and sister. We have many stories to tell of Falcon's triumphs. And tomorrow, I will start designing a new kite, an even better kite, next to the sun, when, inshallah, I will be king again. There's our book. So you'll notice one word in here that we saw a couple times is inshallah. And that means God willing. Um, a lot of people use it kind of like the word hopefully in Pakistan. Um, so it's a really beautiful story. When I saw all the kites in here, I really wanted to make sure that I could share it with you all. And I think you'll have a lot of fun with the craft. So before uh, Miss Anita comes and explains about how we can make our own Basant kites, I want to talk to you about our next book. And some of you might know what the word hijab means and the word Muslim. Remember our moon and star from earlier? So just like the cross symbolizes Christians and the Star of David symbolizes Jewish people and the Om symbol symbolizes Hindus, the crescent moon is an important symbol for Muslims. It marks the beginning of holidays like Ramadan and Eid, and it's on a lot of flags for Muslim-majority countries, not just Pakistan. But I want you to remember that symbols aren't just drawings and shapes. Another symbol or thing that comes to mind when I think of Muslims is hijab. And this is the word for head covering in Arabic, and I'm wearing one right now. In our next book, we're going to get to see a lot of different styles of hijab, which can vary across cultures. For example, in Pakistan, there's multiple ways to cover your head. And even my mom and my sisters wear theirs a little differently from me. And so I brought some hijabs in for you today to take a look. And I'm going to open them up so you can take a peek at the different shapes. Um, and this is also what the word hijab looks like in Urdu. So we read this way. Sometimes the words get stacked, so this is the H sound, and this is the G sound. Um, so you'd read down and then this way. And here are our hijabs. So my mom loves like a square scarf. This one's really big. Um, and the way she wears it is she folds it kind of diagonally, and put it on her head like this, and then pin it in a couple of different spots. And she also covers her face, and that's called niqab. So she'll pin it once over here, and then she'll take the tail of the other one and use that to cover her face. So I'm glad she let me borrow this one. I love the flowers on it. And this is the kind that little kids wear a lot of the time um, because it's just a slip on. And so I actually might have Miss Anita demonstrate this because otherwise mine will fall off. Oh yeah, that's fine. You want to come over here? Sure. <laughs> you can do it. Yes, I'll put it on so it's easy. It has a little rose on it. It does make me think of you. So you put it on like this. And then right under, and there you go. It's all the way on. <laughs> it's easy peasy. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is kind of like the one that I'm wearing right now. It's kind of a plain one. Just long fabric. And the way that I tend to wear mine is I just put it on top, wrap it around once, and then you can pin it a couple of times. My sisters like to pin theirs because. Um, they might be going to like gym class at school and when you're like moving around you don't want it to fall off. Um, and I'll put that over here. 
And the last one I wanted to show you is very like Pakistan cultural wise. Ms. Anita actually recognized the print when I bought this in um, because this is a print that you'll see sometimes in India as well. Um, it's called Banarasi and it's very, very long, right? So this is like a couple of yards maybe, maybe a yard and a half. And to wear this one, you're not gonna really wear it tight. You're gonna put it on and you're gonna cover yourself just all the way. It's nice and cozy. <laughs> So you can barely see my outfit now, which is why I'm not wearing it with this one. <laughs> so those are just a different couple of different ways that you can wear hijab. Um, and I wanted to show you so that you have an idea of hijab being different depending on where you're from, how you personally like to wear it, and all of those other details. Um, I know a lot of people have questions about when you wear it and why you wear it and a lot of these other details. Um, but our book does a really great job of answering those questions and has a lot of pretty illustrations. So I think I'm gonna use that to answer some of those for you today. So our book is called Under My Hijab by Hina Khan and it's illustrated by Alia Jalil. I'll show you that beautiful cover. And the back of this one is also really pretty. Oh. So let's get started. Grandma peeks into the oven as a brown loaf of bread starts to rise. Her hijab is carefully folded, like the crusts on my favorite pies. When she's at home in her kitchen, Grandma fixes her hair in a bun. We mix up some chocolate cookies and share a sweet treat when they're done. Mama makes jokes with her patient as she hears in his ears and his throat. Her bright pink hijab looks so cheerful, tucked into her tidy white coat. At home, Mama lets her long hair down as she rolls up the sleeves on her shirt. We laugh while we plant pretty flowers and make a big mess with the dirt. Auntie works hard in her studio. She's always dressed funky and cool. Her silky hijab towers up high, pinned with a handmade jewel. I help hang my very own painting on the wall of her colorful home. Auntie's hair is streaked pink and purple, a fine work of art that she can comb. Jenna's our fearless troop leader. She makes us the gooeyest s'mores. Her hijab is topped with a sun hat whenever we are outdoors. When dark falls, we huddle together and share spooky stories all night. Jenna's hair glows as she whispers. I shiver and hold her arm tight. My sister is Zaina in high school. Wears something stylish each day. She puts on a fashionable outfit and wraps her hijab in a cute way. Zaina ties up her hair in the evening when she takes a short break from her book. Then we dig through the clothes in her closet to find her tomorrow's fresh look. Iman tries to earn her first black belt. A sporty hijab frames her face. When she cracks a board into pieces, I'm amazed her hijab stays in place. At my house, we dance to some music. I teach Iman moves that I know. My cousin's curls bounce, jump, and tumble as we put on our own private show. These wonderful girls and smart women inspire me with all that they do. I can wear my hijab like each of them or try something totally new. This is a really pretty scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Under my hijab, in a headband or a clip with butterfly wings, my hair shines bright like my future. I can't wait to see what it brings. So cute. <laughs> the sweetest ever. Yeah. So that was a fun book. Um, I hope it answered some of the questions that you guys might have. So you'll notice that when um, Zaina and her aunties and everyone are at work or at school or outside of the house, they'll be wearing their hijabs. But when you're at home and you're around your own family, you don't need to wear it. Um, and also sometimes when you're just around other women, um, they don't have to be part of your family. You don't have to wear your hijab then either. Um, there are a lot of more, more details than that, but I think it's important to know that it's a symbol 
to represent Islam, and it's a really great way to express yourself, and you can do it in a lot of different ways. So I think that kind of brings us back to the end of story time and the beginning of our craft, which Miss Anita will explain today. Hi again, friends. So as we briefly spoke about, this week's craft is going to be making a kite based on the Basum Festival. So if you come to the children's section, you are going to be getting some white and black paper, some colored paper, some scrap of paper, and some ribbon. And you get to make your very own kite. And it can be like Falcons, and it doesn't have to be. It can be completely different. We're also including, you can call this a poster if you will. This is a print call of a page of the book, so you can be inspired to make your own kites. Yeah, your own Basant kites. <laughs> your own Basant kites. So I'm very, very excited for you guys all to come and grab them. They'll be here probably for the rest of the week, if not for just a few days. So yeah. yeah. I'm so thankful that we had Miss Arouge come in and share so much about her culture. So Miss Arouge, can you tell us how to say thank you in Urdu so we can thank you? The word for thank you in Urdu is one word. It's shukriya. Shukriya. Is that it? Yes. Sweet. Well, let's all say that together. Shukriya. Shukriya. I'm so thankful that you came and shared parts of your culture. Is there anything else that you want to share? That's Other all. Cool? Thank That's you it. so much for having me. And everybody stay healthy, stay safe. And please have so much fun with your kites. Yeah. Take you care. get them started now, they'll be ready for Basant in a few weeks. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> take care, you guys. Okay. Bye. See you.